frame rate in video games is everything. For hardcore gamers, ensuring zero dips in frame rate is top priority, with anything less than 60 frames per second deemed inexcusable. It's the single most important factor in delivering smooth, responsive gameplay, and it is the defining metric in which high-performance hardware is measured on. Poor graphics, with good gameplay, a forgivable sacrifice. Low resolution, a retro style, but a low frame rate, unacceptable. It doesn't matter how good the story, graphics, or music is. A low frame rate is sure to interrupt even the most casual gamer's experience. Ensuring smooth, responsive gameplay has been a primary aim for video game developers since the birth of consumer video games in the 1970s. But the idea of frames per second being the standard metric for measuring responsiveness is far newer. In fact, it wasn't that long ago that refresh rate and gameplay differed from region to region. Gaming has many forms. PC, console, portable, arcade, each with their own unique characteristics. For high-end gaming, the PC rules supreme. The consoles deliver a similar experience for a much larger audience. For action away from home, portable and mobile gaming provides a solid platform. And nothing can beat the experience of entering a neon-filled arcade with a pocket full of change and time to kill. All of these platforms have influenced how we view refresh rate in video games, and the metric of frames per second is now a ubiquitous concept. But where did this even come from? When did frame rate become a mainstream idea? How did each decade's graphical styles affect it? How did innovations in graphics hardware improve it? And finally, just how important is having high frames per second? But before all of this, just what is frame rate? According to the Oxford Dictionary, frame rate is defined as the frequency at which frames in a television picture, film, or video sequence are displayed. Wikipedia defines frame rate as the frequency in which consecutive images called frames appear on a display. Today, refresh rate and frame rate are used interchangeably due to the nature of modern LCD panels. But for a majority of gaming history, CRT displays were used, where the terms are not the same. Refresh rate was how often the scan lines were refreshed on the display, whereas frame rate was used to describe how often the picture itself updated. The ideal situation when playing games was for the frame rate to match or exceed the refresh rate of the display. The concept of frames per second originates from the silent film boom of the early 1900s, where hand-cranked cameras produced picture at between 16 and 24 frames per second. By the early 1920s, the majority of picture houses showed films at either 22 or 26 frames per second. When films with sound were first shown in 1926, the industry decided that a standardised frame rate was required, and so 24 frames per second was chosen as the compromise. Almost 100 years later, it is still the standard frame rate that films are recorded and presented in. The birth of consumer television led to new standards being required for refresh rate. 
Since the electron beams that made CRT televisions possible were connected to 50 Hz or 60 Hz electrical signals, these were chosen as the refresh rate for television standards. In PAL and CCAM regions, TV signals output at 25 frames per second, with pictures being interlaced to meet the 50 pictures a second requirement. In the North American and East Asian NTSC regions, TV signals were output at 30 frames per second, again being interlaced to meet the 60 Hz standard. The primitive nature of early video game hardware, such as the Atari 2600 and ColecoVision, led to a variety of strange frame rates. NTSC television would run at 60 frames per second, provided that a vertical resolution of 262 lines was used, the standard in commercial television. But since vertical resolution could be changed by the programmer, in early video games this was not often the case. Desert Falcon on Atari used 280 scan lines, resulting in a frame rate of 56.1 frames per second. Meanwhile, strategy combat game Artillery Duel displayed just 241 scan lines, running at 65.1 frames per second. Of course, on a CRT display, minor frames per second alterations do not exhibit tearing like modern LCD panels, so gamers were hard pressed to notice any differences between each game. The North American nature of the industry at this time led to oddities when games were converted to the slower 50 Hz European model. Some games had built-in conversion between the standards, such that object movement speed remained the same across all versions. Other games included this, but did not update animation tables, meaning that while object movement was correct, animation was slowed down. Finally, many games had no such conversion, being carbon copies of the American release, simply with updated colour mapping. As a result, they were slowed down by 20% compared to the original release, which caused issues with in-game timers and counters. The PAL and CCAM versions of Activision's pioneering platform game Pitfall included a 20-minute countdown timer, which actually took 24 minutes to expire. In the arcade, the high price of cabinets meant that developers could build custom graphics hardware and use custom display technology to produce eye-catching visuals. Early arcades were made up of two types of graphics. Raster, comprising of bitmap graphics on a pixel display, and Vector, which represent graphics mathematically with a series of lines. Raster games were all about brightly coloured sprites, whereas Vector games focused on crisp edges and wireframe models. Early arcade games were mostly raster based, featuring flat, albeit colourful, two-dimensional graphics. But for those who wanted to push boundaries, Vector games could draw primitive 3D polygons, allowing for gameplay not possible with raster graphics. However, vector display technology was expensive. It couldn't be used to display sprites or textures, only lines. The money could be better spent on improved board hardware to accelerate raster games, and thus vector graphics fell into obscurity. Raster boards weren't really powerful enough to drive anything other than 2D graphics. The allure of the third dimension proved too tempting. Slowly, pseudo 3D graphics started to appear in arcade games. To handle the sheer amount of processing required, animation frame rate was lowered, and expensive hardware was needed. Namco's 1982 title Pole Position, which pioneered the racing game genre, 
use dual 16-bit Zilog Z8000 processors to achieve a buttery smooth 60 frames per second. The dual processor approach was a popular one and was used by a variety of arcade vendors for both raster and the tail end of vector games. The 8-bit computer market was gaining ground as kids convinced their parents that these machines could be used for education as well as games. Yeah, right. Unlike the arcade, these systems would be used day after day with a single user, meaning that advanced story-driven games could be developed. To match the ambition of their stories, developers pushed the hardware to the absolute limit with polygonal graphics and large numbers of on-screen sprites. Naturally, responsiveness and frame rate was low, but this was the first time people had experienced video games in the home, and that alone was enough. While games built from the ground up could run somewhat smoothly, acquiring the license for an arcade port was a far bigger priority for publishers than releasing a quality product. The vastly underpowered hardware meant even the most optimized arcade ports rarely ran above 15 frames per second. But again, the opportunity to play something even close to the arcade version meant that this was forgivable. In the arcade, developers who wanted to keep pushing graphical boundaries started producing hardware specifically to accelerate pseudo 3D sprites. Sega was particularly active in this field with its super scalar technology, which provided hardware acceleration for scaling and rotating sprites. The hardware allowed games such as Outrun and Altered Beast to run at a fixed 30 frames per second and further hardware improvements to superscalar technology meant titles such as Afterburner and Super Monaco GP could run at a full 60 frames per second. However, the superscalar hardware was not designed for 3D polygons, and so pseudo 3D graphics was the best it could achieve. The Namco System 21 polygonizer the first arcade board ever, designed specifically for 3D polygon processing, delivering up to 60,000 polygons a second. This was enough processing power to deliver games with mind-blowing 3D graphics, although at 15 frames per second, they were hardly fluid. Despite this, the impressive visuals drew crowds in, making these machines extremely profitable. For arcade owners, this made the ever-increasing prices of arcade cabinets justifiable, encouraging developers to push the boundaries even further. Sega's Model 1 board, costing $10,000 per cabinet, could render 180,000 polygons a second, allowing Sega's flagship arcade games to run at a smooth 30 frames per second. By this time, home consoles had dedicated hardware for processing sprite movement, meaning that for most games, achieving a stable 30 or 25 frames per second was commonplace. But just like arcade developers, home programmers wanted to push into the 3D space. Software scrolling options allowed 16-bit consoles to display very basic pseudo 3D efforts at a decent frame rate with the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 being the most noticeable. However, to bring true 3D graphics to consoles, extra hardware in the cartridges would have to be developed. The Sega SVP chip was used in the Sega Mega Drive port of Virtua Racing, and was specifically designed to accelerate polygons. The game was visually impressive, but it was compromised running at half the frame rate of the arcade original. The 9,000 polygons a second that the SVP chip rendered 
was 1 as much as the Model 1 system board, and at a price of $100 for the cartridge, it was an expensive purchase. For this reason, the SVP hardware was not used for any other Genesis or Mega Drive games. The Super FX chip, however, developed by Argonaut Games for the Super Nintendo, was more successful, delivering genuine 3D polygonal graphics on the console. However, the chip was even less powerful than the SVP, resulting in most Super FX games to run at single digit frames per second. By 1993, the PC had a growing library of games, taking advantage of the raw horsepower that the platform brought to the table. While the PC did not have dedicated hardware for accelerating 3D polygons, the floating point units of 486 and Pentium class processors were a worthy substitute. Its software's groundbreaking pseudo 3D shooter, Doom, could run at a locked 35 frames per second on a high end 486 machine something that even the new 32-bit consoles struggled to achieve. In true 3D games, the PC could outclass console technology, delivering higher resolutions and frame rates. And while the arcade was still the king of crisp 60 frames per second graphics, the growing PC market would spell the end to its reign as the most visually impressive platform. The introduction of 3D accelerator cards, such as the 3D FX Voodoo line and NVIDIA GeForce, as well as intense competition in the CPU space, solidified the idea that the PC was the most technically advanced system. Ultimately, the OpenGL and DirectX APIs, which unified hardware rendering in games, meant that compatibility with hardware from every manufacturer could be ensured. By the late 1990s, the idea of benchmarking PC hardware using frames per second in games became standard practice. With new hardware and software stacks, developers introduced new techniques to improve visual fidelity. Doom 3 introduced unified lighting and shadow effects, allowing light to be cast on moving objects. Far Cry, developed by Crytek, introduced high dynamic range lighting and shadow effects. Crytek's next instalment, Crisis, pushed hardware of the time even further with advanced particle effects, depth of field shadows, volumetric lighting and per object motion blur. These effects became commonplace in the late 2000s, along with other graphics techniques such as tessellation. As a result of these advancements and the arrival of high definition displays, hardware often struggled to maintain smooth frame rates. By this time, the concept of frames per second was common knowledge, even for the average gamer. In the 2010s, new rendering techniques were introduced with much lower overheads than 20 years prior, a consequence of the eighth generation consoles being rather underpowered. Thus, PC gamers started to play at higher refresh rates than the standard 60 frames per second. High refresh rate displays gave those with deep pockets, or those who didn't care about colour accuracy, the ability to play games at 90, 120 or even 240 frames per second. This was especially important for the emerging esports market. The privilege of high frame rates, however, was short-lived. The introduction of hardware accelerated ray tracing, first in high-end NVIDIA GPUs and then in the ninth generation consoles, once again brought hardware to its knees. Enabling even basic path tracing features substantially reduced frame rate, once again making gamers choose between high frame rate and improved visual quality. Today, PC hardware is better equipped to handle these new effects, resulting in smoother frame rates across the board. But developers continue to push hardware to the limits, just as they have 
since the 1970s. Of course, handheld and mobile gaming was a much newer invention, coming onto the scene in the very late 1980s. With low resolution displays and weak processors, games were understandably simpler and clunkier than their console or home computer equivalents. But the novelty of being able to game anywhere was impressive, and on a small display, a poor frame rate wasn't that big of an issue. Portable systems continued to evolve, and by the early 2000s, examples of crude 3D games were starting to appear. Many of these used perspective effects, like the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 to achieve this. By the end of the 2000s, hardware had advanced dramatically, and portable gaming could deliver genuine 3D graphics, albeit still compromised. Finally, the tidal wave of smartphone adoption that would encompass the 2010s, combined with more powerful dedicated handholds, brought high quality, high resolution 2D and 3D games to the masses. But fundamentally, gaming now is not what gaming once was. While hardcore PC and console gamers may revere it, the majority of gaming is done with casual puzzle or resource farming games on mobile devices. In this realm, frame rate is largely irrelevant. There's no denying that in a AAA title, compared to a weak storyline or poor gameplay, a choppy frame rate is the most infuriating. But for most people who play games, it isn't really an issue. Ultimately, we got to where we are in graphics because developers were willing to commit the cardinal sin, compromise frame rate. Whether it's pseudo 3D sprites, shaded polygonal models, texture map details, volumetric lighting, tessellation, ambient occlusion, or ray tracing. Each one of these milestones decreased responsiveness increased sluggishness and lowered frame rate, all to improve visual quality. But fundamentally, they were all essential. Frame rate is everything, but not always.